Hello and welcome to the Sibsey West Midlands Region CPD webinar on the Building Safety Act. Today's event will cover the Building Safety Act, which received royal assent and became an Act of Parliament on the 28th of April 2022. Introduced in response to the Grenfell Tower tragedy and Dame Judith Hackett's report on building regulations and fire safety, it is the most fundamental reform of regulation across the construction and residential property sectors in living memory. It transforms the law relating to the design and construction of all buildings and the operation of higher risk residential buildings. It will have an impact on the work of everyone in the construction sector. The Act creates a building safety regulator responsible for the regulation of all buildings with new statutory roles for designers and contractors on all projects. The BSR will formally come into full operation in April 2023. Our speakers today are Dr. Howell Davies, Sibsey Technical Chief Technical Officer, Sibsey Chief Technical Officer. Howell has received the Gold Award for Outstanding Achievement from the Building Engineering Services Association, BISA, as part of this year's HV News Awards. The award is presented annually to someone whom BISA and HV News believe has gone above and beyond the call of duty for the greater good of the building services industry. BISA Chief Executive David Fries praised Davies granular appreciation of regulation, technical detail and professional standards and his determination to ensure the voice of building services engineering is heard in the places that matter. Dogged persistence and a willingness to speak out are among his key skills, said Fries, who added, this particular recognition marks the coming to fruition of a long project, the push for culture change around building safety following the Grenfell Tower tragedy. Howell is at the forefront of efforts to prepare the industry for the most far-reaching building regulation reform since the Second World War, and we are all in his debt. Tim Sims. Tim is a chartered safety professional with over 20 years of health and safety, fire, quality and environmental consultancy experience on complex projects up to £500 million. He has an excellent knowledge of building safety legislation, specialising within the construction industry and fire disciplines. Tim has provided consultancy support to clients across the broad range of business sectors. He has a track record of successful delivering compliance, successfully delivering compliance programmes for his clients on high profile and flagship projects across the UK. Steve Tompkins is a chartered engineer leader with over 20 years of experience in facilities management, construction, rail and automotive sectors. He is currently Associate Director at One Engage and Product Solutions Superheading Resident Engagement and Compliance to Building Safety Act 2022 and England and Wales Fire Regulations 2022. Steve is a chartered engineer with IMECE and SIBSI, as well as a member of the Institute of Asset Management and certified member of Institute and Workplace and Facilities Management. He is also a member of the IWFM Technology SIG and BSI Facilities Management and Steering Panel for Digital FM Standards Committees. He is passionate about innovation, sustainability and quality of service in the built environment. Adam Eaton is a char chartered Adam Eaton is a chartered engineer with the Institution of Fire Engineers and holds member status. He has significant fire engineering experience working on a large variety of projects throughout the UK and internationally, from a 45,000 seater World Cup stadium in Qatar to 160 meter tall residential buildings in the UK and a large scale 1,400 home development in Birmingham originally designed as the venue for the Athletes Village during the 2022 Commonwealth Games. Adam is experienced in numerous fire engineering techniques and methods such as CFD computational fluid dynamics, evacuation modelling and smoke control calculations. Right, so I think that's, uh, that's everybody then. So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming tonight to our uh, CG, G4C, uh, CPD on the Building Safety Act. So just want to start today saying hello, saying welcome to everyone. Just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors for the evening. So we had Rodney Levin Buckhold and Hard Rock uh, sponsoring the event. So thank you to themselves, you know, without that it wouldn't happen and we wouldn't all be here today. Um, 
quick bit of housekeeping, uh, bar exit is behind you. There you go, you've had most of it already. Um, and if you know, typically if the bar alarm goes off, you know, you can work being a false alarm, everybody get up and you get out. Um, event formats are not this. So we're going to start with the CPD. Um, to last around 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have a small bit of QA, and then we have our CPD send that out. Uh, we'll then have a short break, some food, refreshments out about quarter past seven, back in here, then about half past uh, to take forward the panel discussion. So, what would be really great for someone to ask for a question? Um, and hopefully, the CPD will help jog the brain slightly to, uh, to get a question out of the panelists. So over to yourself then. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So we're all here um, because of uh, of Grenfell. Uh, in fact, I'm going to go back a little bit. Bleh. Right. So it's a un time of unprecedented change. Biggest changes since the Second World War. What I'm talking about tonight applies to all building work, unless I specify that it's about higher risk buildings. We're regulating these higher risk buildings in occupation and operation for the first time, and we've got all the net zero stuff to deal with. So we're here because of Grenfell and the fact that 72 people died. We've had Dame Judith's report, um, which came out in 2018, over five years ago now. And we've also had the inquiry and a lot of industry work on competence, which is a, a key element of, of what I'm doing. So I think we're back to where we were. Dame Judith picked up on four major issues. So ignorance and misunderstanding of regulations and guidance. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, people more concerned about speed and cost than quality and safety. And I think we I can identify with that a lack of clarity about roles and responsibilities. And a lot of the reform is about identifying who is responsible for what and when, so that the industry can stop playing its traditional game of it's their fault. Um, and if you want to follow that up, go to the inquiry website and find the closing address by uh, the lead counsel, Richard Millett. And he presents for about an hour and a half on the merry-go-round of blame. Every single party that gave evidence blamed somebody else for what happened at Grenfell. Um, one or two bodies have put their hand up and said, we could have done better. Um, the Department of Leveling Up being one of them. And then inadequate regulatory oversight. You ever heard of anybody being prosecuted for not complying with building regs? So why would anybody bother about it unless unless they've got other reasons for doing so? That's going to change. So the whole business about guidance and regulations. So you're all familiar with this, aren't you? Now, is that what you have to do? Or is that guidance? The answer is, Approved documents are approved and give practical guidance on common building situations. So, for example, is a 50 storey tower block a common building situation? I don't think it is. So can you apply the approved document? And each approved document covers a different bit of the regs. But you have to comply with all of the regs. So what went wrong at Grenfell? Oh, we were engaged to improve the energy efficiency. Did you stop to think about the fire performance? No, that wasn't part of our brief. Well, actually, yes, I think it possibly was, but we'll let Sir Martin Morbick judge that. So the key thing is building work has to comply with all of the relevant parts of building regs and any other applicable legislation. These are regulations and the really important ones are the Building Regulations, etc. Amendment England Regulations 2023. It trips off the tongue, so I have to read it. Um, 
but that's they came in to force on the 1st of October. They make massive changes to the building regulations, not in terms of technical performance, but in terms of responsibilities and process. And we'll talk more about that as we go through. So the regulations are tucked away, tucked away. In Schedule 1, you've got the functional requirements. So Part B, requirement B1, is about means of warning and escape. You need to be able to tell people there's a fire and they need to be able to get out. B4, external fire spread. Don't cover it in stuff that's going to, the fire's going to spread, to put it bluntly, like they did at Grenfell. Um, internal fire spread. We're not meant to put things into buildings that are going to help fire to spread internally. So, um, Anybody, anybody know of any jobs where they've got pre-insulated pipe work running down a ceiling void over an escape corridor? Anybody checked the combustibility of the pre-insulated insulation? Because if it's combustible and it's running down over, I don't think that complies with B3. Um, and B3 is the building shall be designed and constructed so that the unseen spread of fire and smoke within concealed spaces is inhibited. I'll leave that one for people to think about, but they're the functional requirements. That's what you've got to comply with. And there is going to be a shift with the building safety regulator. It's going to move away from what guidance have you followed to you show me why you think what you have designed if it's built, will comply. You show me why you think what you've built complies. And they will go back to the functional requirements. So that, that is going to be a change. So the building rates changes and the other rates that have come in, they're not changing the technical requirements, but they are bringing in new processes, new processes for building control. Um, so you can't use an initial notice now to start work on a higher risk building. Uh, you have to have a, a full set of plans and a bit more, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, demonstrating competence is now a requirement of building rates. If I'm letting some work, so in my spare time, I look after a grade one listed church in the city of London. And we have to have some electrical work done. I now need to satisfy myself that the people we've appointed to do that work are competent. And that's not just they belong to an electrical competent person scheme. This is a grade one listed building. What's their experience on that on heritage buildings? Well, they've worked on Hampton Court, they've worked on the Palace of Westminster, they've worked on the Tower of London. I think they're probably okay then, aren't they? Because you know, that, that demonstrates well. Um, if I'm doing a hospital job and they've worked on Hampton Court, Palace of Westminster Tower in London, I might stop and think twice. So they're perfectly competent for some, but so that's part of the competence thing. And there are duties now on designers and contractors to be able to show why you're competent. Now, that it's a new requirement I do hope to goodness that this isn't something that is new to us. Um, I'm sure, you know, think of a job you were working on in September. You were competent to work on it, weren't you? How would you explain that to me? Don't do it now. But however you would have explained that you were competent to do that job in September, well, fast forward to October, that's how you show you're competent in October. You know, you ought, it ought not to be requiring you to come up with a whole load of new stuff other than being able to evidence it. Um, so that's, that's the new processes and competence. Um, there will be additional duties on HRBs and I'll talk about them more. Um, and the regulator is going to be uh, taking responsibility for enforcement. They will be proportionate but enforcement is going to be stepped up. Uh, the reason I'm here tonight is because I've been in, in Birmingham for a, a conference with the regulator um, and I've sat next to one of their senior people who was very clear, we are going to enforce. 
if people work with us, that's fine. But the people who don't want to come along on the journey, we will enforce. Um, and he's a tough character from Glasgow, and I wouldn't argue with him in a hurry. Now, important to note that Dame Judith's uh, findings have all been accepted by government. So the Act, the new regulator, the concept of higher risk buildings, building control as a regulated profession. So all the building control people are now busy getting themselves registered by the 1st of April next year, or they won't be working in building control. And that may create some capacity constraints. Um, there's a new regime for construction products, which I will talk about, the new competence framework, procedures for HRBs, um, and they are going to be quite uh, firm about product substitution and design changes, but come to them in a bit. So we've got the Act, um, there's the front cover, and where are we now? What's the new system? So just to remind everybody, this is for all regulated building work undertaken in England. It's different in Wales, but we won't worry about that tonight. Even if you are drinking our water. So just to make the point, it's not just the HRBs. Um, and you can tell the one on the left is in London, the one on the right is in London as well, but it's also them. That's building work. It's covered. You've got to be competent. And it's that, which is a, a local um, domestic project. I did stop and ask them if I could take the photo. They, they were a bit bemused. I didn't explain quite what I wanted it for. Um, and in case you need it, it'll be in the slide pack. That's what's meant by building work. It's regulation three of the regs. So key piece of terminology, what's a higher risk building? It's at least 18 meters high or it has seven stories. Why, why either or? Anybody remember the Bolton Cube fire that happened about six months after Grenfell? I can see a nodding head. Student accommodation in Bolton, hence the name, and it was seven stories. And it was eight o'clock on a Friday night and two of the students were rescued by a hydraulic platform. I dread to think what would have happened at one o'clock in the morning if that fire had started. Students, Friday night, how many of them would have got out? We'd have had another major tragedy. It turned out that building was 17.85 metres high, but it was seven storeys. That's why we've got 18 metres or seven storeys, to stop developers gaming the 18 metres. And it's also got to be of a description in the regulations. So why have we got the height in the act and the description in the regulations? The quick answer is it's much quicker to change regulations. Other building types could be added later. And the three that we've got at the moment are buildings with at least two residential units, so blocks of flats, care homes and hospitals. Key wrinkle. A hospital or a care home is only a higher risk building while you are building it, well, designing and building it, or while you're doing further building work on it later in its life. When it's operating, it's already covered by the health and safety at work regime, by the care quality regime and the health and social care regulations. We don't need another regulatory regime for them. We've got one. Blocks of flats. No regulatory regime whatsoever before the Act came in. So that's why we're regulating residential HRBs in occupation and use and not the, the health ones. And the Act also creates this new role of accountable person who is on the hook for the operation of an HRB. Um, and it's not something you can pass on to a health and safety consultant. It's the freeholder who is on the hook. Again, the HSC are going to be proportionate. Um, HRBs are probably their biggest focus initially. And um, as of the 1st of October, 
All the HRVs in England are supposed to have been registered with the regulator. They haven't all. And funnily enough, the regulator is um, looking at those that haven't registered and will be writing to them shortly, probably inviting them to a magistrate's court somewhere convenient. Because it's a fairly easy one. Is it an HRV? Yes or no. We all know how to do that now. Is it on the register? Yes or no. You know, magistrates can deal with that one in two minutes flat. Um, so HRVs will be the focus, but if people think, oh, well, I'm not working on HRV, I don't need to worry about this stuff, you might not. You might do what you're doing and get it built and get away with it, and nobody will notice. But if anything goes wrong and you're not complying, the regulator now has quite significant powers to go digging in. Ah, so we've got a problem on this site. Um, can I see the evidence that the designer and the contractor were competent? Ah, you haven't got any. Right, we'll go to the designer and the contractor. Where is your evidence that you thought you were competent to do this job? Oh, you haven't got, and you can just see the charge sheet. So they've got this capability to, to, to backtrack. And if you're interested, that link is to a prosecution of somebody over a single story building that went wrong. And a man was seriously injured. It, I'm not sure he'll ever work again, let alone in construction. The person responsible for that got prosecuted, got 200 hours community service. And that was under the, 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 the site safety regime. Um, so the building safety regulator can step in um, a, a, and do more. So aims of the act, just doing a quick time check. Um, so primarily aiming to fix the four big issues that Dame Judith identified, to make people accountable and responsible for fire safety, for structural safety, for, for operating buildings, um, creates the regulator, um, and that's um, now getting up and running with a vengeance, defines high risk buildings, as we've just seen. There's this new regime of competence um, and also oversight. And that's for building control. It's for everybody else in the industry. A clearer um, framework for construction products that is still evolving. Um, residents getting a voice in the system so that they're actually empowered to ask for key safety information about the place where they live. Is that really unreasonable? And there's stuff in there about defective premises and leaseholder protection, which I'm not going to dwell on. And above all, the regulator is looking to drive a change in the culture of the industry. So six parts to the act, introduction and scope. Part two sets up the regulator. There's then a lot of change to the building act. So um, if, you're, if you're not familiar with the building act, um, there's quite a bit in it um, that has been changed by the Building Safety Act, and you need to have both things to look at side by side. I don't know whether the um, whether the government whether the um, all legislation is available on the legislation.gov website. They're quite good at updating stuff. I'm not sure whether they've updated the Building Act yet. Um, because it dates back to 1984. Um, there are things in there about high risk buildings in operation, as we've said, and part five is, is all about construction products and even architects registration. Have we got any architects in the room? Splendid, I'll, I'll go through the major change that could affect you, but I hope it won't, because you're not going to be a naughty architect. <laughs> um, and then there's a whole load of techie stuff in part six. Um, so moving through it, part two sets up the regulator, gives them complete oversight of the building control system. So where you've been used to working with approved inspectors and they are all handled by the CIC approved inspectors register, that will cease on the 31st of March and they'll all come under the regulator. Um, the regulator is setting standards um, and a code of practice um, for all building control professionals, and they have to register. 
and the regulator is responsible for enforcement now. Um, and for all higher risk buildings, the regulator is the building control body. Now, that doesn't mean they are going to recruit hundreds of building control professionals. They are letting contracts uh, to third parties to work in what they're calling multidisciplinary teams. Some of you may even be involved um, and, and they're doing that so they've got access to the skills that they need. And um, as I've said several times, this isn't just HRBs, it's all buildings. And the regulator has a responsibility um, to assist and encourage us all in the industry, as well as registered building inspectors, to improve our standards. So that's all in part two. Um, and they are looking to improve competence across the industry. That's going to take time. It's not going to happen um, overnight. Part three, as I say, extensive reform of the Building Act defines HRBs. Um, and again, it applies to everything, all building work. The Building Act covers England and Wales. So the changes apply to both. How they're implemented in Wales will be different. Um, so if anybody is involved in projects in Wales, um, you need to go and check what the Welsh Government is doing. We're going to get gateways for the design and construction of high risk buildings. Um, there is lurking in there provision to regulate other professions beyond architects who are already are regulated and building control professionals. Don't know where that will go, but it's in there. It's worth bearing in mind. Uh, part four is the new regime for HRBs and occupation, and it um, covers building safety risks, so that's primarily fire and structure. Um, although, interestingly, in conversation today, somebody from the regulator said, we have actually got to think too about the problems that led to the death of the two-year-old Awa Bishak in Rochdale, who was killed because the flat he lived in was damp and mouldy. Um, and the Building Safety Act focuses on fire and structure, but actually we know there's more to building safety than just fire and structure. Um, the definition of accountable person is in there. What's the difference between a principal accountable person and an accountable person? Um, go back to my photo that had the shard lurking in the background. The shard has got retail, it's got Warwick Business School funded by overseas student fees, it's got a hotel, it's got offices, it's got a pent, it's got apartments. You might think about a penthouse. So multiple uses and multiple people responsible for the different parts. So the freeholder is the principal accountable person, and whoever's looking after the other bits is each an accountable person. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, seven stories is probably 20 or so stories. It is empty. It was a hot block. Yes. And with regards to smash, there's a repeat here crossing to the left of the spring, get very conservative. So, under this building safety act, does that mean to say that as it's an existing building, if I'm not occupied any, there would still need to be a person who's accountable for that building? Not under the Building Safety Act but somebody is responsible for it under the Fire Safety Act. And if it were to be occupied again as an office, particularly if it's multi-tenanted, then somebody's got to think about all the Fire Safety Act stuff, fire risk assessments of the external walls, the common parts. Uh, if it's converted into residential, that is higher risk building work. So that would have to go through the processes I'll talk about in a bit. Um, it does sound as though demolition might be a good idea. And that also comes under another act, but not for tonight. <laughs> is, seriously, is that helpful? Um, so we've got accountable and principal accountable persons. We've, 
Um, the meaning of occupation is defined in law, so people can't wriggle and the requirement to register. And then once a building is registered, it will need a building assessment certificate and a safety case report. Um, and some of you will have come across the golden thread, which is all about keeping information about high risk buildings. The golden thread only applies in law to higher risk buildings. As do some of the other pr processes I'm going to talk about, Gateway 2, Gateway 3. What is becoming clear is that some of the bigger contractors have decided that they are going to apply the new system across the piece because they don't want to try and run two systems in parallel. What happens if somebody isn't sure whether they're working on a tower block or a residential block and they use the tower block process the office block process, not the resin. They've just created a huge compliance problem. So make everybody do it all to, to the more stringent regime is the approach a number of big contractors are taking. And they may well then also do golden thread. Um, and there's, there's requirements about engaging with residents um, and residents will have a right to ask for information about their building which can get interesting when the freeholder doesn't want to play ball. So I said I'd talk about architects registration and um, for architects, if they are subject to a disciplinary order by the architects registration board, which is the body they have to register with to call themselves architects, they may choose to join the RIBA as well, but that's not a requirement. Um, they have to be registered with the ARB and any disciplinary findings can now be published on the website. Well, for those of you who are doing a good job, that must be a good thing because it's exposing those who aren't. And we need a bit more transparent and, and this regime will create more transparency. It also means if you're looking to appoint an architect, it's probably worth going and looking on the ARB website. Um, the new Homes Ombudsman is being set up under this. The new Office of Product Safety and Standards has been set up using Part 5 of the Act. And I'll say a little bit more about that. So um, Part 5 of the Act gives the Secretary of State new powers around construction products. The ambition is that there will be a general product safety requirement that will cover all construction products. Now, don't ask me how it's going to work tonight. A, I haven't got time, and B, I'm not actually sure I can tell you yet because we're still waiting for the detail. But that is the very clear direction of travel, and that is going to require some form of standard for all construction products. And I am told, and I, I trust the people who tell me this, that roughly a third of construction products are covered by standards. Many are not. That is going to have to be picked up. And um, there we are, that's what I've just said. So we expect to see the general product safety requirement. There is talk about a list of, st of safety critical products. Not entirely clear what they're going to be yet. But if it's not fire doors, I'll be surprised, as well as other things. And new liabilities on materials producers who produce defective products. And they're quite draconian. Any materials producers in the room, I suggest you go and talk to your lawyers tomorrow morning and your insurers. And there are building liability orders which will allow people to pursue manufacturers of defective products. My advice is don't produce a defective product. If you are a manufacturer, those sections are worth a look, as is Schedule 11 of the Act. Um, if you just want to know what the new responsibilities are, that's where to go. So moving on to building regs, um, major overhaul of the 2010 building regs, new Part A dealing with duty holders and competence, um, new regulations for the building control process. Um, initial notices have been scaled back quite considerably. You can't use them for so many projects. Um, and um, you now 
that the term now is um, an application for full plans approval um, for, um, for, for work. Um, and it's worth saying, again, this is for everything. It's not just HRBs, special rules for HRBs. Um, and Regulation 38, the provision of fire safety information, there are new procedures around that that require building control to be told when the contractor has sent that information to the client and the client then has to acknowledge that they've got it and they find the information is, is satisfactory for them to manage the fire safety of the building. If they don't think the, the Reg 38 information is any good, they have to say so and send it back probably explain why they don't think it's good enough but building control will need to be in on that and I would be surprised if there isn't a focus on that. Part 2a, if you frankly if you're working in either design or construction um, I would recommend you get hold of the building regs 2023 and read part 2a. There is no substitute for reading through and saying, so these are the new responsibilities. This is what it means. This is what it might mean for my firm. This is what we might have to do. But um, very quickly, clients have statutory duty to make suitable arrangements for planning, managing and monitoring the project. That's not going to be a problem, is it? And Clients also have a responsibility to provide information to designers and contractors as soon as is practicable. So that's going to be interesting. There is running through all of this a, a duty to cooperate and collaborate. So the old game of I'm going to keep that information to myself because it might give me a competitive advantage might not be considered an acceptable behaviour anymore. Um, and I know there are contract issues because JCT contracts, it has been suggested, encourage that kind of behaviour. They may need to be looked at. So quite a bit there and um, worth going and particularly looking at these regs because they are the ones that set out what designers and contractors, what, what their competence needs to look like. and. Um, there are also provisions in there in case the principal designer or principal contractor ceases to be the principal designer and contractor. And there are some rules about them leaving the project and what they're meant to do. Um, there, are, um, there, are, there are various duties um, around sharing information in the regs. And there's also a piece about necessary behaviour. The, the two key things being if you don't think you're competent to do something, you've now got statutory encouragement to say so. So if you're asked by somebody in your firm to, sorry, I don't think I'm competent to do this, or I may be able to do some of it, but I'm going to need some help from somebody on that bit. That is behaviour that's being encouraged, and there is actually a statutory duty to refuse to do things that you don't think you've got the skills, knowledge or experience to do. Um, now, uh, yes, if, if somebody asked you to do something, uh, who, who, would the, who, who would the response be? Is it first responsibility for you to say no? Or is it a bit of, you know, because you demand the bar managers to be in charge of knowing what you can and can't do? I would like to think so. I would like to think this is not going to be an everyday occurrence. Yeah. Um, if, if, for example, you are working in a larger design team and another organisation says, oh, we'd like you to do that, and you look at it, actually, we haven't got the competence to do that, you need to go back and say, actually, we haven't got the competence to do this, you need to ask somebody else. Um, and, you know, and not try and just busk it. Um, I'd like to think line managers are looking after people and not asking them to do things that they shouldn't, but I can imagine it might happen now and again, and, and people need to say, say firmly, 
actually, I don't think that's something I should be asked to do. And it might get us as a firm into trouble. Um, yeah, and, and that prompts me to say there are some things in here that are probably going to trigger some difficult conversations. So moving fairly rapidly on. Again, I'm, I'm going to leave you. You're going to have the slides. The big thing about principal designers, this is not CDM under another badge. Why has Parliament passed nine pages of regulations on duty holders and competence when all it needed to say was just it, it's CDM on steroids? No, it isn't. This is about building regs and duties under building regs, not under CDM. The same people may be doing both. It might even be efficient for the same people to do both, but there are two distinct sets of duties. And just to say there is going to be a new culture in building control. You know, the old regime, building control, turn up, they have a look round, they issue a completion certificate. Does that mean the building is compliant? No, it just means they haven't found where it's non-compliant and it wasn't obvious enough. Under the new regime, um, the regulator is going to turn up and they are going to want to have a conversation with the principal designer and the principal contractor. At the design stage, you convince me that you think what you've designed can be built so that it's compliant. Because if you can't convince me, why on earth should I think it is myself? And when it's been built, you convince me that what you've built is compliant. Because if you can't, then why would anybody believe it is? If you, the builder, don't know you've built something compliant. Now, this is back to the accountability responsibility piece. So the responsibility for building compliant buildings rests with contractors and for designing them with designers and building control are there to make sure people are doing it. Um, my suspicion is that building control will quickly get a feel for who they need to have the longer conversations with and where they might be a bit slower to sign things off. Um, they may not actually be that bothered about, for, about guidance. It's back to the functional requirements. So why do you think you've got adequate means of escape? Not have you followed paragraph X in the proof document B1. Um, and the Building Safety Act is about fire and structure, so they may ask questions about how you've dealt with structural issues as well. Um, um, notices, plans and certificates. Initial notices have been scaled back dramatically. Go and check the regs before you try to use one. Apparently, somebody tried to issue an initial notice for a nine storey residential block the other day uh, and had to be told by their local authority that um, that wasn't how you went about those projects anymore. And they might like to go and have a look at the new rules for high risk buildings because that's what they were trying to build. And they needed to go through gateway one and gateway two first. Um, a true story that I was told earlier today. And if I just, yes. Um, the other thing that's worth noting is that any building that is not an HRB that is going to come under the fire safety order, so your 20 storey office block, possibly even a much lower rise office block. If it's got common areas and is multi-tenanted, it's under the fire safety order. Um, the fire, fire rescue authority may need to be consulted before you go ahead. And there are some changes to the terms, which I'm not going to dwell on. I've referred to them uh, already, um, but that's there for reference. I've talked about Regulation 38, um, if you are coming up to the completion of a project, you really do want to go and look at Regulation 38. Moving on into the higher risk buildings. So this is where the stuff is in the regs if you need to go looking. And this is where higher risk building work is defined. Existing projects. 
So if somebody's already working on an HRB, when do the new rules kick in? When do you have to go to the regulator to act as building control body? And um, broadly, um, if you had made a substantial start by the 1st of October, and as long as your approved inspector or building control body gets registered by the 1st of April, you carry on under the old regime. If you hadn't made a substantial start or your building inspector doesn't get registered, you will have to transfer over to the new regime. That's a simple headline version. If it matters to you because you're working on one of these, please go and consult the regs. You might want to get somebody with legal expertise to double check as well, because it's quite complicated. Moving forward, if it's new build, part one of these regs apply, and if it's an existing building, part two applies, but you're gonna have to go to the regulator. And at gateway one, you've got to do the planning stuff. It is planning gateway one, strictly. At gateway two, you need to provide a full design. Now, there are, there's a three letter acronym that will not be accepted as being full design. And that is CDP. CDP is not full design. So before somebody sticks their hand up and says, so how do we do design and build on HRBs? Um, the answer that the regulator will give these days is, yeah, you can do design and build in that order. Design it, get us to approve it, and then build it. And ideally, build what you designed. Um, if what you mean is, can we build it and do some design work alongside? No, you can't. Um, because you can't start building it until you've got the design signed off. Um, I could go on about D&B, but does that answer that one adequately? Full design means full design. And it's meant full design since the 1st of October. Yes. Is there any reference back to um, previous stages, for example? So I think someone stage four or stage three. Um, the regulator hasn't come out explicitly. I'm not convinced that you will be able to satisfy them that you have a full design until you've got to stage four. Um, we'll find out when the first few go in. But um, if you want an exercise in banging your head against a brick wall, then you could play the let's see what we can get away with. The other option is to go to stage four and make sure you have got it all worked up and then go to the regulator. Um, at plan when Planning Gateway 1 came in in 2021, 70% of applications were rejected first time round, um, which is pretty appalling. Um, now, we know more about how to do design to Reba stage four. I'd like to think it won't be as bad when Gateway, when they start getting the game. But you know, they're not going to play games um, and people need to be aware that if you have to go back to the regulator multiple times, it will cost you in one of two ways. One is you might actually have to write a bigger check to be a bit old fashioned because they will charge you more for their services. The other is if you've had two goes and screwed it up, you will be at the back of the queue and you can't start until you've got sign off. So um, you will be costing yourself and your client money. Was there a hand wave? Yes, go on. Say I've got projects for both three and four. But three is really concepts and principles for this direction. Four is the detailed design. Five integrity is one more lost in the details of the design, which is the principles. Yes, and detailing things like fire stopping. Um, I suspect they will be all over that. And I'm I'm not thank you for chipping in because I think that confirms my view. It, it it's almost certainly Reba stage four. I think it's more very useful in government procurement processes, especially you know, the earliest day where you expect expect to be asked to get some guarantee management 
the path we go on to that level of detail. So it's going to be. If it's a public sector body procuring an HRB, they've got to obey the law as well. And you know, that there might be quite a difficult conversation. Yes, sir. Sorry, that's true. Um, can you want to get away to or get away from what's the process? I don't think you can. And I'd be surprised if you can, because I mean you can start doing some work in the office but you you need to recognize that it might have to change depending on the outcome there is that a lot of clients like to put them over things yes to speed the process up but during gateway to the target through the person it is again if the regulator gets what looks to be a very thorough well worked up proposal they may not need 12 weeks. Um, if they get a lousy proposal, then it won't get through however many weeks you give it. Um, so again, people are going to need to think about this. Now, I'm, I am mindful of time. Um, so I'm not going to talk through this in detail. I'm just going to put it up on the screen for now. Oh, you've, you've got it for later. These are all the things you've got to do at Gateway 2, and that's just the starter. And then you need this lot. So you need a compliance statement. Why do we think this building is compliant? You need a competence declaration. Why do we think the people working on it are competent? You will need a construction control plan. How are we going to manage this to minimise the risk of what gets built not being compliant? Change control. Stuff has to change. You know, something you've specified, you can't get it anymore. Um, perhaps it's not being sold anymore. Manufacturers reserve the, the, the right to constantly improve their products and all that guff. So it's a different model number and it's a slight. You're going to have to cope with changes. They need to be controlled. If they're major changes, they need to be taken back to the regulator. And yes, they have time. I think it's six weeks for a major change. Um, moral of story is probably try to avoid major changes. Um, they may not be avoidable, but. Um, and also a mandatory occurrence reporting plan. So um, this will require designers and contractors to go looking for things that are wrong. And by wrong, I mean pose a building safety risk, so a fire or a structural risk. So, oh, somebody's used expanding foam where they should have had proper fire stopping. That's a mandatory occurrence. There are only four starter bars in that stub of a column, and there are meant to be six. That's structural. That's a mandatory occurrence. Um, and there are duties to report them. Um, and there is some guidance and the link is there. Um, I thought I'd cleaned this up so that I didn't duplicate. Um, so, uh, no, I know I've got that. So th there's a bit in there which gives you a little more detail about what they are looking for for each of those um, different documents. Um, and I think I've just talked it through. Um, the ambition is going to be, yes, please. And so, so I'll, I'll go back to my trivial example of my electrician. I want to know what qualifications have they got? Um, are they part of the competent person scheme? Because that means somebody else has assessed them. Um, so that gives me their, their skills and their knowledge. And then I want to know what experience they've got, um, particularly in my building type. So move that across to HRBs. Um, you probably want a building services engineer who is a chartered engineer, ideally with SIPC. Don't tell anyone, but you can get chartered engineers through other institutions, but we don't recommend it. Um, 
you want an architect. Well, if they're an architect, they must be registered with the ARB. Um, HRBs, I think I want a structural engineer there. So have I? Have we got a structural engineer who's passed the part through exams? And with all of them, what what evidence have they got of working on projects like that in the past? Because I'm not sure I want my HRB to be somebody's first go at designing um, a block of flats. Actually, I certainly don't want a hospital HRB to be their first go at designing a hospital. So. Does that help? Hand on the on your left. Just about what we need to the conference of going to five. So you mentioned this combination of qualification, experience, and seeing pressure in child by potentially in child. But what about in situations where you have engineers where potentially have agency degrees, but have 30 on your experience and experience it? Where would they want that, that way to conference because yeah, they may not be educated to a degree or a master degree level, but they have very good experience taking from you, but they have with they still run that competency um, criteria. They they could well do. I think I'd ask one extra question. Um, you can get people who've been doing it for 30 years who think the way they did it 30 years ago is still the right way to do it, and you might want to test that because it may not be right. But assuming you've got somebody who's kept up to date, you, you don't have to have a master's degree to be competent. You don't have to be chartered. There are some things where I think you might say, actually, it would be a real benefit if you were. Um, but the people who've come up on the tools, perhaps did a degree on day release and have worked for 30 years, they can be really good um, at spotting stuff that, Others might not spot. Um, you know, a con contractor staff who've got that level of experience and, and knowledge are generally pretty pretty worthwhile. Um, so no, don't get hung up. You do not have to have a degree to be competent. Um, and and what I think this conversation, I hope what this conversation shows is there isn't a tick list. You've got to do it on a job by job basis. Um, you know, if it's a heritage building, you may want people with very, very specific craft skills or expertise of working with services in a heritage environment. Um, and, and they may not have degrees, but they may be able to demonstrate they're very competent. I'm going to rattle on because I, I am mindful of the clock. Um, so the, basically the regulator is going to want to see evidence you've done all of that stuff. Um, and they're going to evaluate, have we got the evidence? Not, do we agree with the structural engineer's calculations? Or possibly even something the building services engineer has done. Um, the key thing here is it's all very well saying we followed BS so and so or we followed AD. Why does it help you meet the functional requirement? And apologies if I've gone on about that, but I'm going to have a look at page 11 in the guidance that I linked to a few slides ago. Now, very quickly, gateway three, um, because of time, I'm going to summarise it quickly. Have you done what you said you'd do at Gateway 2? Yes or no? And the answer is almost certainly going to be no, not exactly. So what have you done differently? Why did you do it differently? How did you assess that it was still compliant? And where have you recorded it all? And if you can demonstrate that you've made changes, but it's been controlled and evaluated by the right people and recorded and We've actually got those mythical things called as built drawings. They may be electronic. Anything you've seen an as built drawing? <laughs> well, we're going to have to start providing them. Um, and you need to provide the information and golden thread. 
There is a list in Regulation 40 of the HRB regs of all the things you need at completion, and that's in there. Um, and this is really important. Designer and contractor are going to have to sign off that what they have built is compliant if it's an HRB. Um, that I'm not sure that one's sunk in too widely yet. Um, Golden Thread, now this came out of Dame Judith's review, and it's basically the information that allows you to understand the building and the steps needed to keep the building and the people safe now and in the future. Um, it's got to be kept electronically, and this is about giving that information to the accountable person so that they can manage the building going forward. And it needs to be kept up to date. And I think it is going to change the way we design and operate HRBs because people are going to have to stop and think about this at an early stage. Um, certainly, you, you need REBA stage four for um, full design. One of the questions will be, and how are you going to manage the golden thread information during construction? And if the answer is, oh, we haven't thought of that, well, when you have and you've got an answer, come back and we'll have another chat. And no, you can't start building while you're thinking about it. Um, it does mean, you know, buildings get worked on during their life. So the golden thread, new building, it's developed, it's handed over. Five years later, there's some work done on the building. Golden thread needs updating. Actually, in the intervening five years, a fire door got damaged and replaced. That ought to be in the golden thread. Um, some minor modifications were made to something, but it affected a fire compartment. It's gone to go in the golden thread. So there's going to be a management issue. Um, one of the other things, um, the residents wanted broadband. So Mr. Sky, other providers are available, came in and drilled a few holes. Who checked whether they were fire compartment walls? And does Mr. Sky have the first idea how to fire stop? Probably not. Well, you know, that's going to be something that building operators are going to have to think about. How do we manage that? How do we stop that? Um, so Golden Thread is much more about process and approach. And I'm pleased to say that the software industry appears to have stopped trying to sell Golden Thread solutions because I think they've got the message that there is no such thing. Um, again, details of the legislation in this slide, which I won't talk through. Registering HR, existing HRBs, the details are in here should you need them because you get asked. Safety cases, um, there is, the, the HSE don't like this being referred to as guidance, but when I asked one of their people what would you call it, he said, well, actually, I can't think of a better word than guidance. Mm. And they've got a real aversion to guide, it's because of the approved document business. You know, oh, it says in the HSC guidance, therefore, if I've done it, I've complied. That's not quite the approach. Um, but all HRBs will need a safety case that demonstrates how the accountable person suitably advised, because they aren't all going to be able to do this themselves, suitably advised can argue that their building is safe, that they know what the key risks are and they know how to manage them. So the student block of flats, they will need to have a think about how do we stop students doing silly things and perhaps lighting fires at one o'clock in the morning as some sort of a prank when they're perhaps not thinking straight. You get my drift. Um, block of flats occupied by older people, you may need to think more about the mobility issues and getting those people out um, in case of fire. So what, and I'm nearly at the end, um, so, please stick with me. This is a new framework for design and construction of all buildings. Lots of new processes, no changes to the technical requirements. And I won't run through the detail because I think we've done that enough, but this all came in on the 1st of October. 
Building control for HRBs has changed. The regulator is the control body. You've got to get through gateway two before you start to build it. Um, the stuff about managing change and recording it, um, more rigorous completion certificates and sign off of compliance, that slide a few slides ago. Um, and if principal designers or contractors change, that the information has got to be handed over properly. Implications for building owners, well, we're regulating blocks of flats for the first time, and they've got a load of extra stuff to do as detailed here. The enforcement regime has changed. Some of the time limits have been dramatically extended or even removed. There are now compliance and stop notices. A compliance notice, don't like the way you're doing that. I want you to change it because I don't think it's compliant for the following reasons. They probably won't, they will not tell you how to change it. You're meant to be competent. You shouldn't have made the mistake in the first place. Now sort it out. If you need to get advice, go and get it from a competent person. Again, if the regulator is regulating, they can't be a designer as well. It's a conflict of interest. And um, stop notices are serious. If there is a stop notice and it's served on work you're doing, you will have to declare that stop notice for the next five years if you are looking to work on an HRB. It's deemed a serious sanction. So it's a little bit, I'll, I'll say it's a little bit like a yellow card. I don't want to make it frivolous, but you know, Certainly in soccer, yellow cards are totted up through the season. And if a player gets too many of them, they get a ban. Um, so that is there. People need to think long and hard and don't get stop notices is the simple answer. The remaining slides are lots of links to regs, um, to the stuff that came out at the beginning of the year for HRBs, if that's relevant to you. Um, the stuff that came out in August, um, which includes the uh, Building Rates Amendments regs, some links to some Sibsi Journal articles, which may be of some help, and government um, building safety bill stuff, the legislation website, um, where, where to find the building regs, it's all there. Thank you very much for listening. And that should say any more questions.